Hi, I'm Dr Alice Horton and I'm a research scientist here at the National Oceanography Centre. And I'm Professor Richard Lampett and I'm also a research uh, scientist here at the National Oceanography Centre. We're here on uh, World Oceans Day 2022 to tell you a bit about our research on ocean health. So what we find is that the oceans are changing. They're changing in all sorts of different ways. They're, they're getting warmer, they're rising, the uh, corals are getting bleached. And one of the changes we're finding is that there is an increase in the amount of plastic which is going into the oceans. And that's the main focus of the research that we are doing at the moment. One of the key areas of plastic research that we are interested in is microplastics. So microplastics are very small pieces of plastic that are derived generally from larger items. So when I say small, I mean anything from around five millimetres, which is the size of a grain of rice, uh, all the way down to the width of a human hair. So very, very small indeed. So here at the National Oceanography Centre, we are greatly concerned and interested in the way the oceans are changing. And they are changing. They're getting warmer. The corals are getting bleached. They're rising. Uh, and one of the other things that's happening is that there is an increase in plastic, plastic contamination. And this is of concern to us all, to society at large. Now, plastics are wonderful materials. They are they're flexible, they're cheap, they're versatile, they're all around us. So they do really, really good things. Keep food longer in medicine, etc., etc. But at the end of life, and in fact during their lives, they shed small pieces of plastic. And these are the ones that when they get into the environment, they have the potential to cause really quite a lot of harm. And what we're doing in our group, group is to find out how much material there is there and what sort of harm uh, they do. And that's really quite a serious issue, which we can do something about, and we'll tell you something about that later on. So these small pieces of plastic that Richard refers to, we call these microplastics. So these are defined as plastic particles that are less than five millimetres in size. So this is around the size of a grain of rice, but they can go all the way down to somewhere around the width of a human hair, so almost invisible to the naked eye. Now, microplastics can be formed in two different ways. Sometimes they're manufactured on purpose because they have specific purposes in industry, but also we know that microplastics can break down from larger items, either when they're in use or at the end of their life. And these microplastics then have the potential to become distributed widely within the environment. So nowadays, we use plastic every day in almost every aspect of our daily life from the tyres on our cars to our technology, so mobile phones and laptops, all the way through to the clothes that we wear that often are made of synthetic fabrics like nylon and polyester. So these items, as we're using them, can break down. So fabrics can shed small fibres. Tyres will shed small pieces of rubber and plastic as they drive along the road. And it's these particles that are the microplastics that become distributed throughout the environment. So as I've mentioned, there are a number of different ways in which microplastics can enter the environment. But we also know once it reaches the environment, there are lots of different ways in which it can be transported around. So in general, we tend to use plastics on land, and this is where they start their journey in the environment. But we know then that a lot of plastics enter river systems, they end up flowing through rivers, and ultimately they can reach the sea. But what's important to note is that it's not necessarily a linear process. So some plastics, once they've entered a river, can return to the land, for example, during flooding or during storms. And the same with plastics in the sea. We know that plastics can wash up on beaches. So what we are trying to understand here, as part of our research at the National Oceanography Centre, is how plastics are behaving once they reach the environment and what this means for their fate, so where they end up. So during this transit, there's, the plastics are not staying just as they were. They're breaking down, they're changing in all sorts of ways. So at every stage of it, every stage of its, its transport, uh, it's exposed to sunlight, which makes it more brittle. It's uh, being exposed to physical uh, abrasion. So little bits are breaking off the bigger pieces all the time. And then eventually, uh, some of it is broken down by the microbes and actually is, is what we call remineralized. So it produces carbon dioxide and water. So it's completely broken down all the way along the line 
as Alice has said, some of it is retained. So some of it stays in the estuary or on the uh, shelf sediments or eventually goes into the geological sediment of the deep sea. So it's changing all the time. And we have a really poor understanding of how long it actually lasts. I mean, it's been around for about 70 years that we've been making plastics. But it, it, uh, how long it lasts? People say, oh, it's going to last a 1,000 years. Mm. Almost certainly not, but how long it lasts is a really important question. If we stopped producing it today, we'd still have material in 10 years' time, but would we have material in 500? I doubt it, but it's hard to know. One thing we would say is that because plastic hasn't been around for very long so far, we do believe that the majority of plastic is still within the environment or in use. Unless it's been incinerated, this plastic still exists. And a, a calculation that has been done by some of our uh, scientific colleagues has shown that around 5 billion tonnes of plastic remains within the environment as we speak. Uh, this is equivalent to 50 million blue whales. Well, I should say that incineration is a really bad way to get rid of it, normally. Yes. <laughs> One of the things we really like to do as scientists is getting into the field. And in the context of uh, analysing and understanding what's happening about plastics, that means going into the field, sometimes into quite remote areas, and collecting samples of the environment, whether it's the water or the sediment underneath it, and uh, analysing, bringing those samples back to the laboratory to do analysis. So that's one of the main things that we're doing in, in our group in order to try and understand where this material is, what is the size of the particles, the shape of the particles, and the type of chemicals which are within those particles, because there's quite a lot of different types of plastic. So the research that we're doing is in a variety of different locations globally. So as Richard mentioned, we go to very remote areas to try and find out what's, what are the levels of contamination from human activities that are reaching these areas, sometimes very far away from where those human activities originally occurred. Um, we also, though, want to have a look at the state of our environment closer to home. So in addition to places like the Arctic and the open ocean, we're also carrying out research in UK rivers, for example, in the River Thames, to try and understand how the populated centres such as London and Reading and Oxford are also contributing to microplastics in our local environment. We know then that these plastics can travel very long distances, either within the water, but also on air currents. And this could lead them to reach these more remote locations. So understanding what's happening closer to home can also then help us to better understand what we're likely to be contributing much further afield. So once we've collected these samples, we bring them back to the laboratory and we're really careful all the way along the line not to contaminate it because, of course, as Alice said, we've got this on our clothes or lots of plastic around. So we have to take a lot of care with these samples. We get them back to the laboratory and then we put them under a very special type of microscope which not only measures the size and shape of these particles but also what they're made of. And so we have, I think it's something like 14,000 types of plastic uh, exist. And what this microscope does is to identify which type of plastic. And there are actually not very many types that are in the, in, in the environment as, in general. But uh, we analyze for all of these. So then as a result of that, we know what the concentration of these particular types of plastic and their characteristics. And that goes down to, as I said, down to about the size of a human hair. But in fact, there are loads of particles much smaller than that, which at the moment we're very badly placed to analyse. That's a big, big issue, is what happens to these particles when they get even smaller than the ones we can uh, identify and analyse. So as Richard mentioned, a key part of our research is doing field work and then analysing these samples in the laboratory to really see what's out there in the environment. The other part of our research focuses on experimental studies within the laboratory. So once we know what's found within the environment, we want to know what the effects of that are on uh, organisms, for example, or ecosystems. So we want to try and understand what plastics are doing if animals interact with plastic or if they eat plastics. Are those plastics toxic, for example? Do they cause effects on things like behaviour and reproduction? 
And with these two different types of data, the field data and the experimental data, we can gain a much broader understanding of the real effects of plastics within the environment at the current levels of contamination that we're seeing today, but also to be able to predict this into the future as we believe that environmental contamination will continue to increase as we continue to increase the amount of plastic that we manufacture and the amounts that we use day to day. We've looked at uh, water samples right down the Atlantic, going right from the UK right the way down to Antarctica. And one of the reasons for doing that particular sorts of, sort of analysis was to find out how much was in the water. And what we found there was that actually there was much more in the water than we ever thought we'd put into the, the oceans. So that was really quite a big concern. And as a result of that, uh, we know that the level of contamination is higher than we thought, but we really don't know how long it lasts. We know how much we have a feel, an understanding of how much has been put in, but that's wrong. So that was really quite a big conclusion from that. Other work we're doing in the Atlantic at the moment, which we haven't got the results for yet, which we're really enthusiastic about to find out, is where we put some uh, collecting cones into the water for whole year-long periods, and we're analysing the material which has settled into these cones so we know how much is settling out. So that's the work in the Atlantic. We're also doing work, as Alice said, in the Thames and uh, uh, in the North Sea, and there we've also found plastics in the, the guts of fish, for instance, which is sort of what you might expect, but we're finding it in the fish, in their guts. Uh, and in various other parts of the environment. So this is really important in understanding uh, what levels of the contamination are, where it is ending up in, in the environment. So as Richard has mentioned, we know that plastics are enormously widespread throughout the environment, whether that's close to home or in these very remote places like the deep sea and the Arctic. And we've also seen that animals are interacting and ingesting these plastics. What we're now trying to understand is what effects this is having. So there's been a wide range of research that's been carried out on the ecotoxicological effects of microplastics on organisms. And what this really means is, what is the toxicity? What is the harm that these plastics are causing? Now, the important thing to note is that different species will react in different ways to plastics. Some are very sensitive, some are not affected at all. And this really affects our understanding of how whole ecosystems will respond to plastic pollution. What we have seen, however, is that plastics can cause harm to organisms. So it can uh, do things like affecting their growth, it can reduce their reproduction, and in some cases it can lead to mortality, so it can lead to them dying. What we really want to do is to try and link up the concentrations or the levels of microplastics that we see in the environment with these effects that we see in the lab to work out whether it's likely at the current concentrations or levels of plastics in the environment that they're likely to be having these harmful effects. We've done quite a lot of work in the Atlantic and in several sorts of ways. So one of the things that we've been doing is looking at the concentrations of plastic in the water column. Sounds very simple. Actually, it took quite a lot of technology and a lot of time sending ships out there to do this. So what we did was we measured the concentration in the top few hundred metres of the water between the UK and Antarctica. And what we found there, which was really pretty mind-blowing, what we found was that there was more material there than we ever thought we'd put in in the first place. So clearly, our understanding of how much material we are putting into the ocean is wrong and that needs to be revised. So that's one of the things we've been doing. Another has been looking at the way this material settles through the water column, because it does sink. I mean, people tend to think that plastics only float. They don't. They sink, particularly when they've got a, a covering of, of what we call a biofilm, slimy goo going around them, and they settle. And so we've got these collecting cups, collecting cones, a bit like a rain gauge, and they collect material over years at a time. And we can then identify and analyze the material which is collected by that. So that's the, the second major area in the Atlantic. And the third has been looking at the canyons. Now, you may not know this, but actually the, the continental slope has got these great big canyons cutting into them. And in these, water rushes down and up these canyons. 
And what we've been finding is that these, these are real channels. They're a bit like rivers in flood, flowing down there. And these carry quite large quantities of, of plastic, a lot of material as well. So that's in the Atlantic. Then when we go on to the, the, the rivers, as you know, we've been working in the, in the Thames and Southern North Sea. And what we've been finding there is that the fish have indeed got these microplastics in their guts. And we've been looking at lots of other different environments as well, the water again and in the sediment, to try and find out what the concentrations are in those environments. So what can we do as individuals to try and help reduce plastics within the environment? Now, there are a number of things that we can do. Firstly, we can think about the way we use plastics in our day-to-day -day lives. Are there places in which we can actually remove plastics? For example, if you go to the shops, you could take a fabric bag instead of a plastic bag. Or if you get a, a bottle of water, could you take a reusable bottle instead of buying a new plastic bottle of water in the shop? The other way you could help is to really communicate with people. So talk to your friends, talk to your teachers and your parents about plastics. Maybe they're not aware of some of the problems of plastics in the environment. Maybe you've learned something today that you can pass on. Really talk to these people about what they're doing to reduce their plastic use. There might also, for example, be local campaigns where you could go with a group to do litter picking, for example, in your local streets or on a local beach. Some of these campaigns even collect data for scientific use. So you could benefit twice by collecting data and removing litter. So there are lots of different ways in which you can reduce your plastic use to try and make a difference to this problem within the environment. I think I'd probably add also that the, the bit about trying to persuade industry. I mean, that's it's a really hard thing to do, to persuade industry to change. But they are changing as long as people, the public, you and I, as long as we make enough, provide enough pressure, then industry will change by producing, generating different types of material to make bags, to make toothbrushes, to make all these sorts of things. And toothpaste, it's another, another place you find plastics. Um, so they will change, and that's all good pressure will reduce that level of, of contamination of the environment. And then the third sort of way is in, in changing the law. And that's a really big sledgehammer, if you like, to crack this. But it's a way which is developing. The, our new law is being developed to prevent this use of so much plastic. And I think that's, that's all quite positive. But as Alice said, there's things that we can do as individuals. I think that's really positive. So thanks very much for joining us and for listening to us today. I hope you've got loads of questions. Please type them into the chat box in the Zoom. And uh, if you want any more information on our work, then please visit our website, which is noc.ac.uk.